I asked about the previous chapters from him before that I got that these are two separate like groups. I forgot that we didn't use them as subset of chapters. GDC is not as accepted. Uh, yes, that's what I'm saying. I forgot oh. that part, which is why I asked why the chapters need a scan. Oh. No, no, no. I can ask you the whole thing for Okay, so. Okay, in case if you don't have any scan your code, please scan your code. It's uh, very important that you register attendance so that we have get more fun. Can organize more events for you. Right. So, uh, in case you don't know, um, this week five on Saturday, we have a gay jam. It's basically a one day game jam where you all make um, a game. Basically, I make a game one day that we have themed. And I think we announced on the day itself. So, it's uh, very beginner friendly. Basically, it's for your like, beginners. So, if you're you like you want to make a like get hands on experience of making a game, then that's a perfect value for you to join and drop the heavy money from that from attendance. So, yeah, please get attendance. So, what, what day is there? Uh, week five, Saturday. This week is week two, yeah. So, yes. So, welcome back to our workshop. Um, so in case y'all did not attend last week for whatever reason, I have attached the uh, zip file for y'all to download and continue to follow. So let's recap what we have gone through for the last week. So this is the file from last week that I have. So basically last week, what we went through is we create a game system with like, um, with a root node for game and then the parent the, that's the parent node, and the child nodes include the player and the plank. And as we define the player and the plank, we go through the collision shape and how we use that to determine the interaction between the player and the environment. Basically, for this game, for now, it's just between the player and the plank. And we also determine the movement of the player based on the scripts. So here we have the process function, which is called by the engine for every frame. And this function, in this function, we determine the speed of the player, and then we use the function move and slide to determine the action of the the direction of movement that the player makes, and to return and to allow the user to influence the direction of the movement of the player, we use uh, input class. It's basically a class, and we use methods get action strength left, right, down, up in order to determine the velocity of the 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 character. And then we also went through how to create uh and to create a sprite. So last week we have created we have gone through how to create a static sprite and um animated sprite. So for player we use an animated sprite to make movement of player. So it, uh, last week we deal with two cases when the player is moving around and when the player is static at the point. So when the player is static, we also learn how to determine the direction that the player should. The 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 basically the direction the kind of animation that should be played. So we use a state called is right, which is telling, which is telling whether the player last moved to the right or last moved to the left. So that's about it for last week. So this week, uh, I'll show you what we will be able to achieve at the end of the session. So basically, this uh, becomes a bit like a survival game where basically there's a gun that can shoot uh, bullets continuously and move up and down. And then, okay, um, the health bar, we may not have time to do this session. We may do it for the next session. But yeah, this is basically the result. So let's try to do that. Okay, for now, what we... The result of the game is the player can move left and right, but you can see that the player is hovering on the air. So what we want to do is we want to implement such that the player will fall to the ground whatever the player is in the air. And we also want to implement such that the player only will be able to jump only from the ground. Okay, so let's implement the jump first. Okay, any... So I believe last week I have asked you all to... I have asked you all to... Uh... Think about how to implement jump, right? So anyone has any idea? Yes, no. Okay. okay. I, 
a constant downwards velocity. Constant downwards velocity. Because we can't acceleration is too too much. Uh I think we can implement uh, uh implement acceleration. Okay. So let's just declare a constant called uh acceleration. Okay, let's just let it be 10. We don't have to be at 9.8. So yeah, let's just let it just be 10 first. So what we want to do is the Okay, so now let's uh, try not to implement the... So our first step to jumping is when the player is in the air, we want the player to fall down first and then we implement the jump. So to do that, so, so remember for the velocity, we have two directions, right? Uh, left, right, and up, down. So instead of up, down, we will just let it be the speed of the current speed, uh, the current uh, y velocity plus acceleration. So what this does is basically it takes the current velocity, the last frame's velocity, which is accessed by velocity dot y, and then plus acceleration. And when you call the function move and slide, right, it will detect the collision between the player and the blank. So the velocity when it touch the ground right, it will be reset to zero. So in that way, your velocity dot y will not go to infinity. So let's try. Okay, you 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 saw the effect just now. Okay, let me try to adjust the player a bit higher. No, this speed is just too high for this speed. Look. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. So. I think yeah, acceleration of ten is a bit too much. So maybe we decrease the acceleration acceleration yeah. to one. Mm. Looks like that's still a bit too much. Yes. Hey. But it is a bit of a try and error to see what's the suitable. Yeah, right. Are you sure it's something else here? Did you remove the get action strength for up? Sorry. Yeah, I removed that get action yep. strength. Okay, uh... Yes. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. And the input of is also with the SVG recipe while it's in the chain. Okay, actually, okay. the thing. Okay, the thing about this is. Let me make a reference. <laughs> hmm. Okay, not exactly sure why it is going uh too high. So I mean I am multiplied by delta. Hmm. Oh, maybe it's because multiplied by speed. Uh, velocity. Oh, okay. Wait. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I get the. Okay, that's the issue. Yeah. So basically, I put speed outside. So what I need to do is this is the raw velocity instead of the unit velocity. So remember last time when we find this particular one, it's basically, um, uh, it's basically like it's just a unit vector, and then we multiply by speed. So actually, in this case, we need to uh put speed inside, and then. Okay, what's the acceleration of that? You can put it as, uh, okay, actually, let me increase it back to, okay, let's say acceleration is one. Okay, now it's a bit slow. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that works. 
Okay, so okay. we put a uh, time for both get access strength right and get access strength left, right? Sorry, again. Okay, can you just scroll down a bit? Okay. Yeah, so for the X direction, we still keep it move left and right because we want the we want the player to be able to move left and right. But um, for the for the, the vertical uh, direction, we want the velocity to basically follow this. Okay, let's try again. Okay, anyone? Okay, uh, for now, looks like. Hmm. I I'm doing something else, but like, yeah. you know, get action strong. Okay, uh, wait. I forgot the brackets. Okay, yeah, so, so if you follow what I did just now, so when you play the scene, you should see the player falling down and then you're able to move left and right, but you won't be able to move up and down. Y'all follow? Yes? Um, I want to move to the right, so I'm going to do it. You just increase the speed, uh, increase the acceleration. Yeah, and yours always and need to do the job. Anyone, any issue? Which one? Okay. Okay, so we have allowed the player to fall down. So now let's implement such that when we the player press a button, then the player will jump up. So what we do is Okay, so before move and slide, right, we want the okay, before move and slide, what we uh, what we want to do is uh, let's say the player is uh, press jump then like press jump, right? Then we want the player to have like a constant velocity upwards. So if input uh is so remember we have the we have the function is action just press yes action just read or whatsoever so in this case we can use is action just press which is basically when i press the key then this will be activated so if input is action just press okay let's name our action jump and then we'll define jump later so if is action just press jump then velocity y will be equal to okay let's name a variable called upwards velocity and then we define upwards velocity okay let's say negative 1300 okay so here what i did was i first defined the velocity to be how physics should work so i detect left and right and then it falls down. But then let's say if the player in this frame press the button jump, then I'll have a uh, upwards velocity. But do we uh, even input the map the jump input yet? Or haven't yet? We haven't mapped yet. So why isn't why isn't negative so I don't know. remember like the No, I'm saying that it, why did you put the upward velocity negative again? Won't then make it positive? Oh yeah, it's supposed to be positive. Actually, when we get what what is the better practice to yes, put it negative, down, right? and then uh, and then let it be equal to upward cross. Yes, yes. Yeah. So let's define. So remember the way to define our custom signals is to go to project, project settings, and then input map, 
and then we can add a new action. Here we had uh we did want to define jump, so I type jump and then add, and then you can define your custom button here. I probably put this at Z. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here I define jump and then jump to, and jump is defined to be Z. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Z is it Z or Z physical? Yeah, no, that's fine. Okay. Z is Z physical is fine. As long as it's just Z. Okay, so you should be able to let the player jump. So <laughs> press Z. You see that I jump a bit high. So maybe I want to <laughs> adjust the numbers well, a bit. So let's this be 1000. I'll probably increase our acceleration. Okay, acceleration probably increase a bit more. Are everyone able to do the jumping? I mean, yeah, but <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. We, 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 not that, not that. That's what i you know, what I'm trying to say is, I feel like I'm falling a bit faster than everyone else. Uh, you say your, say your <laughs> okay, so as many of you have pointed out, yes, we are able to double jump, but okay, like, let's say if your game, you in your game, you want to invent double jump, fine, but let's, uh, let, let's say we don't want to double jump, right? So what we want to do is we only allow the player to jump when the player is on the ground. So... Before you're thinking about like how to detect whether the player is on the ground, right? What we can do is we try to see whether there's any built-in function that allows us to do so. So let's go to character body to the documentation. And under methods, while well, we have is on floor. So y'all can read the is on floor, but basically this is on floor, right? It works based on move and slide. So it's very nice that we just use move and slide, right? So we might as well use is on floor. So in in your script, in player script, so when you're checking for uh, whether the player is pressing jump, right? You should also check whether the player whether the player is on ground. So and is on floor. And now you should only be able to jump once. Yes, now very sad that we can only jump once. Okay, so that's about jumping any... Yeah, that's about jumping. Maybe you'll need to do a bit of like tweaking of the content so that the jumping is looser or whatsoever in a way that you want. So any question about jumping so far? So if not, I'll move on to the next thing that we want to implement, which is so for the is on floor is like test the floor based on like condition. Um uh, yeah, it tests based on the call of move and slide. So okay, like if you go back to the redocumentation, right? This like is based on the last call of move and slide. So what you do is you call the move and slide, and then the result of that will tell you whether the next in the in the next frame is on is it on floor or not. Um what well, another thing to note is there's a up direction and there's a floor max angle. So okay, like let's say in a case like, like let's say you want to make a weird game where the floor is actually 90 degrees or like whatsoever. So you can use this up direction, but by default the up direction is basically the natural up that you're thinking about. But uh yeah. If let's say you want to let's say you want to uh make a different up direction, then that's the way. And also floor max angle. So sometimes if you have like a slanted floor and 
this will help you to tell whether you're on floor or not. So parallel to that, there's another one called is on wall. Yeah, it's also called based on move and slide. So let's say if you want to make a game where you want to, want to climb up the wall, then this is also another function that might be useful for you. Okay, so okay, so the next thing that we want to implement is remember what we want to do is also like um enemy that can move up and down automatically and then also can shoot bullets. So okay, so before we move on, I want to uh make a small note on the node structure here. So what we have been doing is everything is in one folder and everything is in one scene. But sometimes this is not a good practice because like, let's say let's say you want to respawn like certain let's say like the player disappear and then you want to respawn respawn the player at another place, right? It's better practice to make the, the player disappear. But let's say the player disappear, right? You lose the information of the player. So what you do is you save the player in a separate scene, and then you can instantiate the player in the scene again, the main scene. So in a way, if you make the, the player to be a separate scene, that means you save the information of the player. So let's try to do it now. Hello. Okay, uh, for those of you that just came, this is the QR code. Please scan for attendance. Mine is like a bit too snappy with jumping and falling. So can you like tell me what scale you are in particular? Like, give me an Okay, yeah, you should uh, What's the okay. scale? Transform. Can I have a copy of the book? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, just finish this one to fix. I have to fix it. So I have to fix it. Our blockage is uh, what housing. Okay. Uh, in case you're the newcomers, in case you're uh did not come for last week's session. Basically, I have already put in the zips uh the zip file from last week. So you can simply download and continue on where we left off from last week. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my player okay, so the let's try to put the player and the plank into okay. two separate what? scenes and then instantiate them in the main scene. So I didn't change any variables. Okay, one thing to note about the folder structure is usually you have to try okay. to organize like let's say all the things that are related to each other into one folder. Let's say enemies in one folder, player and player functionalities in one folder, so on and so forth. So okay. let's try to do that. So okay. new folder. Okay, let's try to create um some folder called map. So this map folder is basically to put in everything that's related to the environment around like optical and so on and so forth. Uh now I do in here, but actually you can just go to the folder itself and then create a new folder. So in map, I would want to. So here in the folder structure, right? Y'all can. Y'all can uh right click on the map folder, and then hover over new, and then scene. So this is how you can create a new scene. So let's name our scene plank, because we're creating a plank. Okay. okay. So now you essentially a new scene with a 2D node as the root. So remember in our original scene, we want the plank to be static body. So what you can do is you right click on the plank node and then you can change type to, okay, here you can search for static body. Uh, yes. Okay, so I, I want to create the new uh, map. Mm -hmm. uh, you right click on the map folder and and then yeah, view. right click on any uh, uh, new
Okay, so from here on, you can just continue with creating the plank. So remember, we need to create a collision shape and then also the sprite. So let's just try to make the plank exactly the same as the plank over here. So what we can do is, okay, so add collision shape. And then, and then under shape, put in new rectangle. And then scale the rectangle. And then add sprite. The sprite. Okay, I hope everyone should be able to create something like this. So you have a collision shape and then you have the sprite. And the collision shape and the sprite shape should perfectly overlap each other. So can save the scene. Okay, now let's go back to the game scene. Okay, so now we don't need this plank anymore. We can delete the node. Um, what's the best way to make the sprite and the plank overlap each other perfectly? Um, there's no good way. You have to manually it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. No. 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 Uh, yeah. We have to scale it up. Drag blank here and then this is your what you do. No. 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 Drag it to the you see this panel, like you see this panel over there. Uh, so you can just, I mean, a shortcut is just kind of like. the plank in the main scene so now this plank over here we don't need anymore so y'all can delete note okay so now we only have the player left so over here the you can right click on the game node and then here yeah, there's something in drop scene so click on that and then basically you you have some suggestion uh, suggestions so basically we need to instantiate blank so we can see the plank pops up at the origin. So what you can do is we shift the plank to the, the original position that we want. Yeah. 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 
because never see. Okay, so you delete the old plan. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you just repeat a uh, bit for now. Okay, why well, the one Okay, uh, so, uh, weapon, so weapon uh, when, you, when you play and it goes back to it. Because your collision was in the second machine, so now you just go to collision and go there to open up all the tables. So now I'll move on. Okay, so before y'all do anything to the player, right? So uh, just now I will just show you how to create a new scene, but actually, let's say you accidentally, let's say uh, you accidentally created a player in like another scene, but you're supposed to create a player in a separate scene, right? So that's a shortcut over here. If you right click on it, uh, make a sequence. So here, there's a shortcut called Save Branch as Scene. So, okay, before that, before that, I should create a folder hmm. called Player. And then I save the new scene in the player. Okay, Save Branch, branch as Scene, and then I save in Player. Yeah, so what it does is it creates a new player scene for you and then it just instantiates the scene right in the root node that you are on. So yeah. Yes. Go to your plan, see. Okay. Yeah. 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 Y
Okay, yeah. So some of you might encounter this problem also. So basically, the player is able to fall through the plank. Yeah, so the way to uh, fix this problem, remember last week, the way that we yeah. control whether the player collides with the plank, right, is based on the is based on the collision layers. So if you go to plank, okay, let's go to, wait, let's go to player C and then collision. So mask to, the player is mask to, and remember, Move and slide works on based on mass to uh based on mass layer. So let's say if move and slide detect another object that's on layer two, then it will tell that it will tell that that is a collision. But let's say if the object is not on layer two, then there won't be any collision. So let's check whether plank has layer two or not. Collision layer, yeah. So there's no layer two. That's why it can go through. So what you can do is you make the you make the plank to exist on layer two. That should do the trick. Okay, hey, I'll scale down the player a bit because. The, the player now looks very ugly. Okay. Oh, center. Position will just put zero in both of these. Okay, so y'all should be able to achieve the same functionality that we have tried to achieve just now, but uh, instead, each of the object in uh, the game, basically the player and the blind for now are in their separate scenes. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, if the X is the seat, the player scene is the one of the one of the ones that you can counter this if it went on to the whole distance. Cannot see. Well, because like, you already played as a scene. So yeah, then like the origin is going to counter that. Wait, so now there's no player scene that's going to No. Okay, so I'll move on. So now I, so now we'll try to create a uh, enemy that can move up and down automatically. So let's try to do that. So first step is just to create like a static, like a static enemy, and then just put it there first. So let's create. Okay, before we create the scene, we should organize a folder, right? So let's create a new folder. Get new folder called enemy. And then in the enemy, I'll create a new scene. So new scene. And then here, the scene should be, okay, let's just name it enemy.
Okay, so here the enemy which is intended like a, a character body as like the player, but there won't be a new script yet. So in enemy, we change the type to character body. And then the character body must have a position shape and some kind of animated sprite or at least a sprite. So let's add child node to collision shape. And then under collision shape, we put new rectangle. And then we try to scale up the rectangle. Okay. And so your if you want animated sprite, you, you can do also, but uh for now let's just make it simple. So we just create a static sprite. So add child nodes sprite. So this one, you can also use your own assets or whatsoever, but um, in Godot, if you... So in Godot, by default, if you create a new project, right, you are given an icon. So you can use this icon as you like. So let's move this icon to assets first, that because we're going to use it as an asset. And then when you select the sprite node, under texture, Okay, uh, actually you can select the file and then put into the texture. So I just selected the icon and then put into the texture. So in that way, I have created the sprite with the actual image. And then I'll try to scale up this image so that it matched the collision shape. Is there any folder in the enemy? Can you open the transform? Sorry. The what? Uh, for collision shape, the transform so that I can like estimate the power. Or... Okay, okay. Thanks. Actually, right, there's a ruler on the side so you can estimate like how big the how big oh, the right. shape. Yeah. Okay, so. Mm. Are you a player already? Yes. Can I do a player? The player, right? You just make a shortcut just now, so if you let me know. <laughs> you go into the game, the you know, the scene. <laughs> And then right click on play right click on play right click and then our uh, safe branch as you see no then you just create a new folder and then just leave it Okay, so after you have created the enemy, you can instantiate the enemy in the in the root scene. So again, right click on the game root node and then instantiate child scene. And then you select enemy. So the enemy will appear. Uh can scale down a bit. And then and then move the position of the enemy to be around here. So we just create an enemy and then we just put it there in the scene. So if you play the scene, you should see just the enemy being static there, doing nothing. Okay, everyone is able to follow. Okay, so uh, let me see. Okay, I assume everyone will be able to follow. So I'll continue from now so okay so now we want the player to be able to 
okay, we want the enemy to be able to move up and down uh, automatically. So we would need some kind of script to do that. But what kind of script, right? So what we can do is we have a timer, and then every time the timer times out, we would let the enemy to change direction. Okay, so before we do the timer, let's just make the player move in constant direction. So let's let's make the player let's make the enemy move constantly upwards in like in by certain uh by a certain velocity. So if I right click on enemy, attach script. So I attach a script to the enemy. So in case you all create a template. You can just delete the template and follow what I'm doing. So again, to to allow the player to allow the enemy to move in constant direction, we need to call it. We need a function for that, and then we define the velocity there, and then make it move and slide. So, uh, define function function process. And again, just a reminder: when you use the function process, this function process is basically called by the uh, by the engine every frame. Uh, so under process, we can define velocity to be okay. I'll show you in uh, I'll show you the shortcut uh, for defining upwards velocity. Okay, so let's um uh, define the the speed of the player to be okay let's say around 20 20 okay let's define it uh, 20 for now and then for velocity to define it to be constantly upwards we can make it vector 2 dot up so vector 2 dot up is basically a unit constant upward uh, velocity uh, vector velocity so Vector two dot up, and then we want it to be moving in the speed that we want, right? So multiply by speed. And then remember, after we have defined the velocity, we need to call move and slide so mm. that the player, uh, so that the this character body will move. So move and slide. So let's try. So now it's moving upwards, but it's moving a bit slowly. So you can adjust the the value of constant speed so that it moves faster. Oh. Yeah, and so you can see the the enemy just move up, right? So now we want the player the we okay before that uh. <laughs> Okay, so uh, <laughs> okay, how do I make it? Yeah, and then you can feel that. Wait, but uh, can press shift or control to scale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> 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 
to catch up so i'll continue okay so now we have made the, the the we have made the wait we have made the enemy to move up constantly so what we want to do is we want the player want the enemy to also move down after a period of time so what we do is we create a timer and then every time the timer times out we will change the direction of the we will change the direction of the enemy so let's try to do that so right click on the enemy and then add child node. So here you can search for a node called timer. 
and then add the timer to the enemy. So, wait. Okay, before we make it like a loop, right? So what we what we want to do is. Okay, okay. Let's create a let's create a variable called is up, which is initially true. And then, okay, like you imagine, if this variable is up, we would want to the we want the player to move up. And if the if is up is false, we want to the player we want the enemy to move down. So, what you can do is instead of vector two dot up, you can do is up. And then if it is up, then we use vector two dot up. If not, we use vector two dot down. Unexpected. Oh. Okay, wait, sorry, my syntax is wrong. So what to what you should do is vector two dot up. If is up, else factor two dot down. Okay. Okay. So what what I have done is basically an inline if else statement. So it basically this statement it basically means that if it is up, then I'll return this value. If not, I'll use this value. So that's basically what it means. So the syntax just now that I use is used in some other languages, but in particular Bodo and uh, in Python as well. This is the inline if else statement. So it's the value, and then the if the conditional statement, and then the alternative value. So now we have uh, is up is always true. So it's always so the um, so the enemy will always move up. So what we want to do is when timer times out, we would change direction. So you click on the timer on the on the root on the node tree, and then under under on the right right you have two tabs inspector and node, so you change to node tab. So under this node tab, you see you have you maybe a group sorry signal. So basically, there's a list of signals that you can that you can make. So in particular, we are interested in this signal called timeout. So timeout basically whenever the timer is time uh, is timing out, then uh then we we'll do something. So what we we'll do is. We double click on timeout and then it will tell you to attach to whatever thing, right? So what so let's say okay, let's say like you have uh let's say you have a tree node, tree of nodes, and then you have like multiple script, then there'll be multiple options for you to attach to wherever you want. But here I want to attach, so there's only enemy that has the script. So basically you, you can only attach this signal into the enemy script. So when you click on enemy and then connect. You can see that there's a new function that pops up in your script. Okay, so under this function, we want to define something to change direction of the enemy. So to change direction of enemy, we just basically is up is equal to not is up. Basically, flip direction of is up. So if you click on note on the note tree again, and then under the note tab, you can see that under timeout function, there's like a signal over here. It indicates that there's some signal being being uh being used somewhere. Okay, like let's say if you are in another script, right? Okay, let's say you see there's a signal here, you don't know where the square where is being used, right? You can just double click on it. It would and it will take you to where the signal is being used. So in this case, it's being used in enemy script. Okay, so you might be wondering like how long how long will it time out, right? So to determine how long it will time out, you click on the timer node and then under the tab, right, you go back to the inspector uh, the inspector tab. And then here there's a wait time. So wait time basically indicates how long it will time out. So here maybe you want it to change direction only after like let's say five seconds. And then here there are some other properties that are quite important. So one shot is basically whether to continue the timer after the timeout. So let's say if you take one shot, right? That means 
after it, it times out, it will not start the timer again. But if you untake timer one shot, that means after the time is the timer already, it will con it will restart the timer and continue. So basically, after five seconds, it will emit the timeout or um, signal. Yeah. You under the under the C uh under the tree node, uh node tree uh you click on timer, and then under inspector panel. Okay, another property that you should take note of is auto start. So auto start is basically to tell whether when when this particular scene goes into the main scene, whether to just start the, the timer. So here we want, let's say if you don't auto start, right? The timer will never start. So what we want to do is just auto start and then let uh and then let the timer goes on. So we should take the auto start and untick the one shot option. So Let's try it out. So after around five seconds, it will go up and down, up and down. So the thing really. Okay, so at this point, you might want to do some adjustment to the constant. So let's say I will want it to change direction a bit faster. So maybe two seconds. And then I will want the speed to be a bit I want it to move a bit faster, so maybe 300. Yeah. Okay, maybe this is the speed that uh, we want. Oh. Yeah, maybe here I'll pause a moment for questions. Is able to follow. Uh, so far, I think everyone is able to follow. So I'll continue. <laughs> so, so what we have done so far is make the player uh, make the is to make the enemy move up and down. So maybe you can do a bit of tweak so that it moves faster and then make sure that it the the up and down it covers almost the entire screen. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to fire the bullets. So. Okay. Uh I okay before I go to the bullets. Okay, I have posted an image in the Learn Godot channel. So y'all should have this image already. And you can put this image inside your assets folder. So it will be imported by Godot. So 
Let me do it as well. Okay, if I put, so basically what I did is I copied the bullets image into the assets folder. So, and then under in Discord. So under the assets folder, I should have the bullets ready. Okay, so now let's try to create the bullet. So remember whatever like, whatever like uh, object Let's say if there's an object inside the game, we should put it as a separate scene. So here the bullet is actually can be treated as an object, right? So what you do is create, create a new scene as uh called the bullet. But remember for this bullet, right, it's related to the enemy. So what we can do is we put the scene inside the same folder as the enemy. So under enemy, under for me folder, we we right click on it and then create a new scene called what is it? Okay, we create a new scene called bullet. So let's go to 2D panel. So this bullet is right now look 2D. So again, we can change the type to uh okay, this one. Okay, for bullet, right? Usually bullet we can let it go through an enemy or let it go through player whatsoever, so and so forth. So what um, so a good practice for it is to use area 2D. So you search for area, we have the option for area 2D. So again, area 2D, it also can interact with the world around. So what we need to do is also instantiate in we add shell load collision shape to it. Okay, and then when the collision shape is there, you can put in a new rectangle and then scale this up. Okay, let's make it a bit small. Okay, and then, so first we can create a animated sprite for this bullet. So because we already have the uh, we already have the set of bullets, right? So animated sprite, and then under animated sprite, so under inspector third panel, under animation, mm -hmm. we can create a new sprite frame. So there, there should be a new sprite frame over here, and then we click on it. So. So you should be brought to this particular uh, panel where you can edit the sprite frames. So what you do is you can import any kind of uh, bullets that you want. So remember there are two ways to load. One way is to load uh, frame by frame by just importing the entire image, which is at frame, but we want to load using particular spots on one frame. So basically this icon over here and press on it and then under assets, and then bullets. So now you import to this panel. So remember, you need to adjust the horizontal and vertical so that it divides the, uh, it divides the bullets in the correct numbers. So horizontal should be around 40, and vertical is around 24. So you click the right number, you can see that the grid basically divides the bullets in the Correct uh, number. Actually, vertical should be 25. Now, vertical should be 25 and 40. So, once you already have the grid to divide in the correct way, you can zoom in and choose the bullet that you want. So, in this case, I will choose this bullet over here. So, I click the four frames. So, once you're able to choose the bullet already, you click the frames that you want. And then add four frames. So now I'll have the four frames of the bullet that I want. And
Okay, if you're not able to see the uh, if you're not able to see the bullet, usually because the animated sprite is very small. So what you should do is you scale up the sprite so that you are able to see it. And then Before we move on to add to the functionality of the bullet, right? Maybe we want to instantiate the bullets uh, as okay. I remember the game that we want to be able to achieve by the end of this session is basically after uh, like around the same amount of time, then the uh, then the enemy the will enemy will spawn like bullets and then the bullets will fly to the right, right? So what we want to do is okay, let's try to go. Mm. Uh, Okay, let's try to instantiate the bullets first. So under any under enemy script. Okay, the way to instantiate is first you need to load the scene. So to load the scene is you declare constant. Um uh, okay, let's call this bullet with a capital B. Capital B in case you want to know is basically it indicates a class. So preload. So under preload, there's a lot of link. Like basically, you need to put in the correct link. But in case you want don't want to find the correct link, you can just on the left on the left side. That's the folder structure over here, and then you just drag the bullet into the position. Okay, so this basically declares the class in the class bullet inside the enemy script. So to instantiate, right? Okay. Uh. So we don't want to instantiate every single frame, right? We probably just want to instantiate like on timeout. So let's do another timer. So enemy under enemy, right click on it, and then add child node. And then we can have a timer. Okay. So this timer, let's name it a uh, bullet timer. Basically, it indicates that this timer we use for bullet. And then we can adjust the timing. So let's say we want every 0 0.5 second to spawn a bullet. And then it should auto start. And then it should not one shot. So the property should be the same as the timer for moving up and down. Basically, it should auto start and it should restart whenever the timeout is when it, whenever it times out. So um, okay, and then what we can do is under the bullet node, under the node tab. We press on timeout, 
and then we attach the signal to the enemy and then connect right so on timeout we want to spawn the bullet so the code to spawn the bullet is basically so first we declare a variable bullet is bullet dot instantiate that's basically create a new instance of the bullet class so we have created an instance, but what you need to do is we only we also need to add to the scene. So to add to the scene is okay, let's just do this and confirm that we error, but anyway. So let's just add child. So basically we add the instance of the bullet to the scene. So after around 0 0.5 seconds, a new bullet should spawn in should spawn in the scene. So let's try and see. So you can see there's a bullet, but actually, okay, like in case if you don't know like how many bullets are spawned, right? Actually, in this case, it looks like there's one bullet being spawned, but actually there's a lot of bullets being spawned at that particular particular position. But so the way to know, right? If you if the game is running and then you go back to your editor, so under scene, right? So you see like there are two tabs. So there's a remote and local. So local is basically in your working directory, but remote is basically to see what's happening when in the uh, in the game itself so you see there's a root and then there's a game and then under game there's enemy and then under enemy you can see that there's actually a lot of bullets being spawned over here so so let's try to figure out what's happening right so here we have an add child and so what does this add child do right so let's click on it so add child is okay like so this add child no, uh, this add child code right basically at the child at the particular at the particular instance as a child node of the current node. So basically, because this script is attached to the enemy script, right? It's It's basically instantiating the bullet inside uh as a child node of the enemy. Y'all can follow so far what I'm talking. Uh, Okay. So when you're when the game is still playing, right? Oh. You are you yeah. so you let the the game play on, and then you go to your editor, and then so usually you will be in your local, but then there should be a remote tab. Uh, okay, uh, 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 Okay, so you can imagine, right? You don't want the bullet to just follow the enemy, right? You want the bullet to be static relative to the scene itself. So what you should do is you should instantiate the bullet as the child node of the parent node instead of just child node of the enemy, unless you want the bullet to just stick around the enemy. So, but in this case, we want the bullet to just be, okay, like, and then you can see, right, after a while, that becomes very laggy because like there's a lot of bullets inside the scene. So, Okay, let's close this scene. It's even lagging. Okay, anyways, so what you should do is you should essentially as a parent node. So how do you reference the parent node, right? So the way to do is just get parent. So this pair, get parent, right, basically returns the parent node. And then you ask the parent node to add child instead of adding the child in the current scene. I, I don't get it. What, what does it do? Okay, get parent is basically it access the parent. And then so get parent returns the parent the parent node, right? And then you ask the parent node to return to add child. Basically add because you don't want to add a child because the add child then after you uh transform. It means that the guy goes in and into the Yeah. So let's try and see the difference. Okay, but now it basically adds the bullet at the origin, as you can see over here. 
So what you want to do is, because we are not able to make the bullets move, but at least maybe when the enemy moves, right, you want the bullet to be at the same position as the enemy. So what we can do is, so if you don't do anything to the uh, to the new instance of the bullet, right, the default position will be at zero zero, which is why it is at the zero zero position right now. So what you should do is you should adjust the position to be the same as the enemy. So before you before you add child, right, what you can do is bullet dot position. So remember, position is a built-in uh, property, and this position is is basically a built-in property of uh, area 2D, as well as character body 2D, and so on and so forth. So basic position is a built-in character, uh, is a built-in field. So bullet the position, and then you can assign it to be position. So what does this do? Bullet the position is basically the position of the bullet, and then the position without the, the dot, is basically the position of the enemy. So if okay, like without the bullet dot, right? The vision is basically the position of the enemy because this is the script attached to the enemy. Let's say if this script is attached to the player, then vision refers to the position of the player. But in this case, it refers to, to the position of the enemy. So what you do is you assign the position of the enemy to be the same and uh, of the bullet to be the same as the enemy. So let's try. So you can see that the bullet it spawns at the position that the the enemy moves at. Yeah. Okay, so before I move on, maybe I should scale down the bullets further. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so basically like let's say if the enemy is like position if let's say the enemy is like channel of like another one that's moving around. So what you can do is global position instead. Position. So in this case, actually, global position and position are the same. But in the case that the pair moves around, the global position may be different from position. In this case, you can use either global position or position. It, it should be fine. Sorry? Get parent. Get parent. Oh, get parent is basically a return the, 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 the pair node. The current node. So this in this particular script, right? The current node is the enemy. So the parent node. So if you look at the structure of the game, right? You see that this oh. is the current node. So this script is in this node, right? So parent node means it gets the game. It gets the game node. And yeah, add it as a child to the game. Okay, so if you play the game, right, and then if you look at remote, right, you can see that the bullets are actually child node of the game instead of child node of the enemy. Okay, so okay, before that, I should scale down the bullets first. Okay, so there are a few things that are not working here. So first is the bullet is not moving towards the left, which is what we want. So we would need to write some script so that the so that the bullet will move to the left. And second thing is it's not rotating. Why? Because the animated and remember animated sprite you need to make it play, so it won't play by default basically. So let's try to do those two. Uh, why is my bullet like uh, Wait, wait, wait. Let, let, let's do together. Okay, so for the bullets, um, attach script, and then, so, again, remember, 
the ready function is the function that is called when it first entered the scene. So we can use that to make the an animation place. So function ready. So remember to select the node, we can use the shorthand uh, syntax, the dollar sign, and then just call the name of the node, which is animated sprite, and then play. And here we have the, uh, we only have one animation, which is default. If you change a name from default to something else, you should call that name. In this case, I did not change. So I just put it as default. So when you play the game again, you can see that the bullets are rotating. Okay, so that's one. Okay, so now we want the bullet to also move to the left at a constant uh, speed. So let's define speed. Uh, let's put it uh, 400. And then remember the function that is called by the uh, the engine every, every frame is process. And then, okay, in this case, you don't have to use move and slide. Actually you can, because for area 2D, right, it can just overlap with other objects. So what you can do is position, you directly modify the position property. So position plus equals factor two dot left times speed. So what I do is I add vector two dot left times speed, which is will be the velocity vector, and then I add it to the position vector. So this way, and so basically it will move to the left with the constant speed. Okay, think <laughs> very fast. So maybe I should decrease the speed. Okay, just a side note, right? The the velocity that's being used by basically the velocity that's being used by move and slide is much slower than the velocity being used if you add it just add it directly to position. So okay, this is still a bit too fast, so maybe I decrease it to 10. Okay. Okay, this a bit. Uh, this might be a bit difficult to play, but uh. Okay. Anyways, y'all can do the uh, the the balancing by yourself because I will, I will not bother you with the details of how to balance and so on and so forth. So y'all. Wait. Okay. So, uh, uh, Because like mine is, I mean, it's 
Okay, so okay, let's um uh, okay, so now we have already made the bullet to move towards the left and then and then make the bullet spawn like for every let's say zero point five second or whatever second that you're set. Um so what we can do now is to make the bullet to damage the player. Okay, before that, I think there is a bug that is not fixed, maybe. Okay, it's not okay. Anyway, so in case that if your player is able to ride on the enemy, remember it's basically works based on collision shape. So if I go to enemy and then I click on the enemy node and then under collision. So now I have layer one and mask one, but let's say if I exist on layer two. Remember the player has mask two. That means if the player um uh let's say yeah, just now the player was in mask two. Okay, let me check again. Yeah, mask two. So let's say if the enemy exists on layer two, I will be able to jump onto the enemy. Yes. Okay, so but but this is not what you want, right? So what you should do is to not let the enemy exist on layer two. Okay, so, but before that, uh, okay, let's make the, okay, so usually in a big project, right, what you should do is you should define like which layer belongs to which one. So let's say, this, just now I have made the player to, for mask two, and then the layer of blank is two. So I can define the layer of uh, the map to be in layer two. So what I want to do is, okay, let's say layer one to be, layer one to be uh, of the player, and then layer two to be of the map, and layer three to be, to be of the enemy. So enemy will exist on layer three, and player to have mask two to be able to interact with the map, and it should have layer one, and enemy layer three and blank to be layer two. Okay, yeah. So again, layer two should have collision of layer one and mask two. The reason is it exists on layer one and it can interact with two, which is the map. And for the blank, the collision, uh, the collision layer should be layer two because basically it exists on layer two. For enemy, it should exist on layer three. Okay, it will come to be a, it will come to be handy in what we gotta do now. Okay, so the bullet, right? So okay, so what we want the bullet to do is so there's a signal. Okay, if you select the bullet and then under the node tab, there's a signal called body enter or area enter. Okay. We will use body enter. So body enter is basically whenever there's a body that enters the area, then it will emit the signal. And then we can do whatever to it. So if we if I double click on it, I can connect it to the bullet script. 
and then I can define, I can do whatever here. So, what I want to do is I, okay, like, let's just assume that this body that enters the, that enters the map, right, is the player. Then we want, then we want the player to take damage. So what we want to do is to say body dot take damage. And then we define damage. So let's define damage to be, let's say 10. And then put it as the argument. So basically what I've done is I, whenever something enters the bullet, I will, if the, if the, and if another body enters the bullet, I'll ask the body to take damage of 10. Wait, why did you put 10 in take damage? Hmm? Yes. Okay, so remember this take damage, right, is not defined yet. So we need to define this take damage inside the player, inside the player script. So, okay, let's, let's not define like health or whatsoever. So let's just define the function take damage and then I put in a damage variable. Okay, so let's just uh, print something out first. Taking damage. Okay, so I don't deal with health or whatsoever first. I just ask the player to take damage by printing take, uh, taking damage. So let's... Okay, so another thing is Remember the bullet, right? Area enter, we only want the body to... Uh, let me go back to bullet script. Okay, so this body, right? How can we make sure that the body is always the player? So the way to do that is I click on the bullet and then it's under inspector tab, under collision. So it shouldn't have any, it should not have any layer of existence. And then it should have mask one. So mask one is basically it can detect the player and can interact with the player. So because I have the bullet to be mask one and I have the player to be layer one, so they can so this body. So because I have mask one, right? So I know that whenever a body enters, this body will always have layer one. And the body that or the only body that has layer that has layer one is the player. So I'll so for sure I'll know that the body that enters is the player. So let's okay. So if you're wondering like where will it print right when you play, there's an output over here. So you see the if you see the terminal right. So it's taking damage. See like uh, it's not taking damage. Okay, yes, yeah. another taking damage. Basically, you have to whenever there's a Bullet passing by the player, you see that taking damage. So in this way, you also this is also the way for you to debug. Like let's say you can print something out in the terminal to see whether the function is called or like printing some certain values or whatsoever. So maybe I'll pause for a moment to take questions. Yes. Uh, your function on body enter body dot take damage. Why do you use the Wrongly there. Oh. Yeah, it should be damage.
Okay, so just now I have defined the take player and take damage function. And then I'll ask I have asked the player to take damage, right? So what we want to do is we have some kind of health variable, and then this damage should be subtracted from the health. So what you can do is you declare okay, let's declare constant max health to be, okay, let's say 100, and then I'll have a variable for health, which is instantiated to max health initially. Okay, so under this function take damage, right, what we want to do is we want to subtract amount this amount of damage from the health variable. So health minus equal damage. And then, okay, because like now we don't have the UI to show the health yet. So what we want to do is we probably print out the health. Okay, so let's try and see. Okay, let's purposely take damage. So we can see that 80, 70, 60, 50, 40, 20, and it is gonna go negative. So what you want to do is okay. So you see, right? The health can go negative, but intuitively, what you want to do is when the health goes to zero, you want to the player to disappear from the scene, right? So okay. Besides printing health, what you can do is we check whether if health is equal is equal to zero, then we ask the player to die. So if health is smaller than zero, die. Okay, so that is not a build function. We have to define the function die. So function die. So the, the code to disappear the player from the scene is uh, Q3. Okay, at this point, right, you might be wondering, like, why do I declare a function die and then for in only in function die I call q3 right so as of now uh our game is very simple so when the player dies we just 
make the player disappear from the game. What if in future, right, what you want to do is like, let's say you make some kind of animation or like some kind of thing before the player dies. So that thing can be very uh complex, right? And also like maybe you want the player dies in like different scenarios. Maybe it's just not health equals zero. Like maybe when the player falls down, you also want the player to die. So in a way, if you define a function to be called when the when the player dies, it's either to manage the animation and stuff. But for now, we only in the under die, we only make the player Q3. So let's play and see. Okay, I'm purposely taking damage so that uh you can see whether okay, so actually you can see right. It stops at negative less, 10. Less than equal to. Less than, uh, equal to can also, like, I mean, it depends on how you want the game. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you can make it health less than or equal to. So, you go to remote, right, under game, and then you can see that there's the plank, the enemy, a bunch of bullets, but there's no player. Basically, the player has already disappeared from the scene. <laughs> Okay, so okay, maybe a fourth moment if you want to go up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me check if there's anything else I need to cover. Okay. Uh, that's about it for today. Hmm? That one is it will take a bit of time to put in, so probably go through for the next session. Yeah. Yeah. So uh wait, let me think, let me think. Okay, so for today, uh, there's no homework or whatsoever, but uh, maybe what you can do is you try to balance the game. So as of now, the game is a bit difficult to play, right? Like, that's, the bullet is very dense, and also it's also very difficult to jump. So maybe what you want to do is you want to play around with the constant so that it's easier to jump and um, play around it. Yeah, so that's about it for today. If you have a question, you can stay back to us. If not, you are free to leave. No, I... Oh. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs>